So I covered today uh, a bit of a hodgepodge of things related to publishing. I was also charged with uh, talking about metrics, um, about ethics, and also a little bit about uh, where we see publishing going in the future, uh, the paper of the future, and then the editorial uh, job as a job for you, a, a potential job opportunity. So without further ado, I'll just run through uh, quite a few slides, so you will stop me when I'm out of time. Um, we, we have four journals at, at EMBO. Uh, the oldest one is the EMBO Journal, uh, which I'm the editor of, uh, which was launched in 1982, um, really um, in parallel with the emergence of molecular biology as, as a broad discipline um, beyond nucleic acids, really. Um, EMBO reports, um, so the EMBO Journal publishes full, um, sizable papers, basically. Um, EMBO reports is a journal uh, which was launched uh, much later um, and, and publishes short reports um, with uh, what you could call it singular findings that, that are limited in not so much in size but more in, in the scope. Um, they're very uh, high conceptual advanced but, but uh, smaller in the uh, scope than the EMBO journal papers. So, so if you have an exciting story that hasn't been uh, filled out with nitty gritty mechanistic detail, that's the journal for you. Emo Molecular Medicine is our newest journal, which we've just launched, so I, I'll dwell on this a bit more on the next slide. Molecular Systems Surgery was our first open access journal, um, launched uh, 2005 with the open access movement, and, and is, as the name suggests, is a bit more uh, uh, specialized, but extremely successful in its uh, niche. So what does EMBO actually do, just as a very quick introduction? Um, it uh, basically is an association, um, it's a scientific uh, society that's um, composed of 1,400 elected members. And uh, it's quite small, it has only 35 staff, of which about half work for the journals. Um, it also runs um, a fellowship program for postdocs, um, a young investigator program, and it's great to see a couple of young investigators here, actually, so I do apologize, I've just given some of the same slides to them. Uh, couple of weeks ago, so you can ask me really challenging questions now. Um, and uh, the EMBO me uh, membership, which is current, uh, constantly evolving um, with more and more members. And we have a conferences and workshops uh, um, department, which uh, has about 75 workshops a year, including this one, I believe, and uh, the papers, of course, the journals, of course. So EMBO like medicine, as I said, is, is, is brand new, and, and I would all encourage you to, uh, to, to submit there. It's really trying to um, address an, an, an issue that was that, that was put to me today, actually, that the EMBO journal is publishing too much molecular biology still. So as a group of journals, we certainly moved well beyond that now, and this journal really epitomizes that, but also the EMBO journal itself is publishing more and more developmental biology, stem cell biology, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is typical data from, from the journal, which is probably the best way to to see what the scope of the journal is. We're just gonna have the first impact factor released next uh, in, in a couple of weeks, and it's looking quite promising. It's somewhere somewhere above uh, eight is, is our feeling. It's, it's always hard to know exactly what it's gonna be because they mess around a lot with the, with the, with the algorithms. Um, it has a great chief editor, Stephanie Dimler, a cardiovascular biologist from Frankfurt University, and you can see a very nice um, uh, board of senior editors. Um, we also have a conference. Um, to, to showcase the, the journal in Heidelberg in December, and I would all invite you to come. It's specifically geared for, for postdocs, really. Um, it has, has a great speaker list, which you probably can't read, but it's a really superb speaker list. Um, the kind of sessions are cardiovascular disease, uh, stem cells, oops, that's repeated, stem cells, uh, molecular and cellular interaction information, genetic and epigenetic basis of disease, and microRNA. So very much top topics that come in, 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 this, uh, in, in today's sessions also. Um, I also want to make a quick point about open access because there's more and more pressure to publish in open access and of course we would love to have all of our journals open access. Molecular Systems Biology after five years has just managed to, uh, to break even basically. Um, it's essentially uh, we've taken those journals as close to open access as we dare to go with, without undermining the revenues, um, the, the financial model because this is actually supporting a lot of the initiatives that I just told you about like the Young Investigator program. So. Um, we have an opt-in system, 17% of articles are open access anyway and because an author chooses to pay a fee for it. We, uh, we allow authors or we actually do it for them uh, to self-archive after six months on PubMed Central or UK PubMed Central and after 12 months we replace that version with the final version of the paper, uh, uh, which is very important. I think many journals don't do that. So you have two versions that, that basically stay in the literature forevermore and, and it kind of contaminates the, the, the published record. Um, and, and then everything else up front, um, like have heavy scenes sh uh, and reviews and editorials, are actually open access anyway. And the next step, uh, we probably open up all of our data for, uh, 
for open access, and I explain to you why, why we plan to do that in a minute. So uh, why do we still publish scientific papers at all? So a little bit of philosophy at least. Um, there's 80,000 journals in science, technology, and medicine out there, which, which is an absolutely astounding number. 20,000 of them are listed on ISI or Scopus databases. And uh, it's quite clear that access to research papers is becoming easier and easier through advanced search functionality. So why do we, in particular, still have top journals? I mean, the answer is fairly obvious. In the end, it's because as science is growing so rapidly, people need to have ways to actually assess that research. So the journals act as filters of information. You, you know that in a top journal, you have enriched good quality information, and it's actually worth reading, uh, browsing the literature there. Um, they're increasingly used for research assessment, and this is, has uh, negative sides too, which we hope to discuss um, as part of this talk. And do ask me questions about this um, at the end. Um, there's a very new de development, which is huge journals that are developing, like PLOS One and uh, a number of clones. There's about eight clones of, of the, that journal now. PLOS One is uh, due to publish 9,000 papers next year. Uh, sorry, this year. So it's growing absolutely tremendously. It's basically a, a one-size-fits-all journal with, uh, with no frills, with a 70% acceptance rate. So there's a good chance that these kind of journals will replace most of those 80,000 uh, journals as we go forward. So there's going to be a dramatic shift in in, uh, the, liter in, in the uh, journal landscape. But I do think the high, the high impact for, bet for which of a better word, journals will remain because they will uh, continue to be an important part of research assessment. And I hope they may um, so that people read across the subjects a little bit. I think that's a crucial part of science that people read beyond their one molecule that they're working on. So what's the editorial process at our journals? Um, we have professional editors. This slide is meant to point out that, that we have, um, at, at EMBO Journal, we have six professional editors plus myself. Um, at, at EMBO uh, uh, Reports, we have three professional ed editors plus a reviews editor. So um, that's sort of ballpark. Um, we interact with the authors at conferences like this, and of course, when they sub submit their manuscripts. One important point I want to highlight is that we increasingly, um, before we send this decision back to an author, um, interact with the author bef before the decision, so we can actually see what they, what points, what response they have to the referee comments bef before they, uh, before we send the final uh, decision. And I would certainly be interested to see what you think about that. Um, we have an editorial board of uh, about a hundred people, very international and um, great, great experts. And um, there's about two or three experts per per subdiscipline, really. And then we usually go to three referees. We don't. Uh, we extremely rarely go to, to more than three referees, just in cases where there's an extremely broad manuscript. Um, and then one thing that I introduced, um, I won't go into now because I have another slide on this, is referee cross-commenting, uh, which also really enhances the process. So we have um, these seven editors. Um, they're all subject specialized based on, on their research backgrounds. They're all postdocs. They uh, spend about two hours per manuscript. They get about two new, uh, three new manuscripts a day to read. And uh, they also commission reviews materials and, and spend quite a lot of time actually traveling to conferences. Um, we have this editorial board, which is, which is um, increasingly international. That's something we're really working on strongly. It's only 16% international. And we do replace them with a, a three-year tur turnover. Just a few statistics, about 3,000 submissions per year. Um, ab about 21% um, of those go to the board, uh, editorial board for advice. And we send out about um, a, a quarter to peer review. Now, of the peer-reviewed um, uh, manuscripts, we um, Tend to we reject about 54%. That's real data. It's not tend to. It's actually real data from last year. Um, and the average time that takes the first edition takes three days, three, not just working days, three days. And the peer review process takes 29 days. We're trying to hard to reduce that process um, to to below 25 days, but that's proving to be quite difficult. And at the end of the day, we uh, we do have a policy of one significant round of review, which is very important we do uh, end up accepting about 12% of manuscripts. That goes for all the four journals we have. And um, as I said, 90% of the manuscripts do actually undergo only one major round of review nowadays. So, that, so we have succeeded in establishing a single round rather than multiple endless rounds of peer review. And another important statistics, I think, is that 3% of the re revisions we, in, we explicitly invite at this point, so we're quite stringent here, but the revisions we do invite after peer review have an exceedingly high chance of actually getting accepted. Um, just 3% of those fail in the end. So you have a 97% chance of getting accepted if you're invited to resubmit. We have quite a, a low appeals rate, which we think is an encouraging sign. And, uh, but we do take appeals if you find you've been uh, mistreated by anyone. Um, because um, there's an interest in, in, in editors as a career path, I just wanted to point out the kind of backgrounds of these editors. Um, 
they all had international postdoc experience. Um, so you can see they're all senior postdocs. They had all one or more postdocs. Um, one of them was a PI, a junior PI. So um, you can see that it's all quite international and in very good labs. So, and of course, we select people that com complement the expertise of the team because we need to have experts in all major areas of science. So we have a developmental biologist, we, we, we have a cell cycle expert, and so on, a trafficking expert. Okay, um, if you have specific questions on that, just ask me afterwards. Uh, we do spend a lot of time on the decisions. I just have to point this out because there's also a lot of criticism about um, professional editors. So that's a typical file. We basically um, um, summarize the paper just like a referee would. Um, we, we, we write each experiment, the, the key experiments, then what our assessment of the advance is and so on. And then we, uh, we cut and paste in a few um, relevant papers here. In this case, I think three or four papers. And then it went to two other um, editors for further comments. And then when the revision came in, the same process happened again. And this was the decision letter at the end of the day, which always has a fairly sizable paragraph. That's actually a short letter um, spe specifying why we made the decision, okay? So we're trying to be as open and transparent as we, as we possibly can. And we're definitely not, uh, I, I just would like to make that point, we're definitely not the <laughs> Journal of Universal Rejection. We don't take a particular pleasure in rejecting manuscripts. It's uh, just part of the... Uh, the process overall, and you can certainly ask me why we reject manuscripts at all. Um, editorial board advice, uh, we do use the board um, in about 21% of cases, and most of the board advice is actually to reject a manuscript. So we feel that we have enriched for, so, so we're making the right decisions already at the editorial level, basically. Um, and we do analysis to try to see how, how well we do, although there's a lot of caveats about this sort of analysis, it's just important to, to, to see what happens to papers we reject. So most of the papers we reject do come out uh, within a couple of years, um, so this was from 2007, about 75 of them have now appeared, and m the vast majority appeared in journals of lower impact factor for, for what that's worth. Now, uh, but uh, another measure is how well they actually cite. So the, the average paper that was rejected from, from us that's published cites about half of the, pa the average papers in, in the EMBO journals. So I think we're kind of enriching for, for the right papers as measured per citation, which is obviously a rather dubious measure, which we can discuss in a minute. Um, we do, we have improved the editorial process quite a lot over the last couple of, or the last year really. So we have a ex very explicit scooping protection now where um, throughout the submission and during the invited revision period, ho however long it is, it normally is three months, but it's um, endlessly extendable if nothing else is published, you're completely protected against getting scooped from another journal. We have this one round, which I mentioned, and we do have detailed uh, decision letters. So we're kind of opening ourselves up for, for appeals, basically, which is why many other journals don't do that. Um, but at least you know why, why you were rejected. Um, we do have a pretty high-speed process, as I pointed out, and we really try to develop interjournal manuscript transfers with referee report, reports um, between uh, nature titles, be between various other titles. So I think that's a great way to enhance the process because the bottleneck really is the peer review process. So the author can then choose if they found they had good referee comments but they were rejected anyway at a journal like Nature because they wanted too much, they could come to a journal like ours and, and we might just accept it with the referee reports that we have. And we do this already quite frequently between the four journals that we have. And we add values in other ways, which I don't have time to go into, I think, now. Um, the point about article metrics, I think, um, just a couple of points to make. One is there's a real problem with the ISI impact factor because it blends together impact to research papers and review papers. And, and uh, it's an al amalgamation, and uh, as you all know, uh, review uh, papers tend to cite more because they basically um, aggregate a lot more information, and it's actually easier to cite a review because you, it saves you from reading the primary paper. There's often multiple primary papers on one issue. It's much easier to cite the review. So, so there's an enrichment for, for citations in reviews. Now, journals game this by publishing more and more reviews um, to increase the impact factors. Author game this also by inc to increase their age index and personal uh, impact factors by publishing more and more reviews. There's an overproliferation in reviews in certain fields like IPS cells. There's significantly more reviews than actual primary papers, I think, now. So there's, there's a real problem. The real problem is not the journals, but each citation to review is taking away a citation to the primary paper. So the author, the primary discovery author, loses academic credit for their discovery. So the impact factor is already flawed from that point of view. Okay, so that's, that's some, something I think the, the community should really lobby um, ISI to, to change. And we have not been very successful doing that. But if everyone started lobbying, I, I think that would be, would be more successful. 
The second point to make is that, that the same measure can be used in multiple ways to, uh, uh, to rank journals. So the ISI um, journal impact factor is, is a two-year time window, um, basically. So it's, it's more or less a random time window that's, that's measured. Um, and here you have a, just, just, just the selection of journals, Embo Journal plus Biology, Plant Cell, etc. You can see this landscape, so Embo Journal will be kind of midfield here. But if you use the same, the same measure, which is called the Shimago factor, which is um, calculated from, from a Spanish um, group with a more complex alg um, algorithm, you get a very different landscape. So the PLOS biology is suddenly doing much worse than the Embo Journal. So this uh, filters out self-citations um, and, and so on. So that, that already changes things very, very dramatically. Now, ISI calculates themselves the eigenfactor, which is based on a five-year period rather than a two-year period. And you can immediately see that and, and exclude self-citations of, of journals. And you can see that immediately changes the, uh, the, the landscape even more. So PLOS biology again does worse, but plant cell does really badly here com com compared to the uh, Shimago factor. This is all based on the same raw data. Um, now, the SNP um, is from Scopus. That's a new database that does pretty much the same as ISI, but it has more functionality, really. Um, it costs a fortune, though, to subscribe to. But this, this, the SNP has yet again another landscape. So, so um, SNPs basically try, try to filter for, citation, for average citation volumes across fields. So certain fields have a um, lower average citation than others, like microbiology papers tend to be cited less than stem cell papers. So it tries to filter uh, to, to, to balance for that. And you can see dramatically changes the landscape. Um, other journals, like um, really the PLOS journals, have, have really hyped a lot about this, is um, to replace the impact factor with, with real-time uh, web access statistics. So against every paper, you have primary web access. That's really nice, and I think it's great to see uh, web access de developing. It's great for us to follow, um, to compare di uh, different fields and so on. But it's very important to emphasize that it really doesn't replace the impact factor. It's actually even worse, because um, just um, people clicking on a paper has nothing to do with the quality of the paper at all. At least the impact factor has something to do with quality because you, ha you have a pretty high activation energy to actually cite a paper. To just click into a paper, um, all it takes is to put sex in the title and you're going to be in the paper and you're going to have a huge, uh, you, you can shift this graph up dramatically. So, so it's an alternative measure and the beauty of this is it's, it's real time. It's really fast. You can immediately see how well your paper is doing. So I think it's fine to, to publish this but it certainly doesn't replace the impact factor. And last point on this is that finally some, um, it's really important that you lobby your, your institutions, that, that the people that assess you actually read the papers that you've published. It's uh, crucially important, it's a huge burden. And um, one solution is, um, which the Wellcome Trust has started and the DFG in Germany, is that they ask authors to select the five best papers that they think they've published, irrespective of journal name and so on. And they will just consider those five papers in the grant review. In principle, that's great, but of course, the reality is that, that, that it doesn't solve everything, as you can imagine. Now, I will move quickly on to transparent peer review. Um, this is something that, that we've introduced uh, about uh, one and a half years ago, and I will explain what this means. What we really want is to move from, from a peer review process where, which says, is the data that's submitted to us at this time uh, good enough for publication, rather than what do you think what you could do to, to improve the paper in the future? which is really often the reality at high-level journals at the moment. Um, so what, what we basically do is uh, we retain a single blind um, peer review process, which I think is very important. So basically the, um, the authors do not know who the referees are, but what we do is we publish peer review process files, and I will show you, show you what this looks like in a minute. We also publish our editorial uh, processing statistics, so everybody knows how fast we are and so on. And we have abolished confidential comments to the editors. So what you get as an author is what the, what the editor saw to, reje uh, to reject the manuscript. So you know exactly what, what, what the facts are. And we put those, uh, the details of why we made a decision into the decision letters as best as we can. I mean, uh, these are not multi-page letters, of course. Um, we also encourage co-refereeing now rather than hiding that fact. Um, a, a lot, lot of big laboratories, of course, uh, the, the PIs will use their senior postdocs to do the peer review for them, which is, which is actually in principle great, and it's part of mentorship, I think, to encourage that, but it's essential that the PIs actually supervise that and check through the report, filter out too far-reaching points. We, we just discussed a few, few of those cases today, actually, with a few of you, um, and, and then signs off on the report and actually name, names the co-referee, because if you've done all the work, you should also get, get the credit, at least with, with, the, uh, with, with the journal editors, okay? Um, I'd already mentioned cross-peer review. Um, referee choice is obviously very important. We also have this fixed bar. 
a referee cannot ask for new experiments in the second round. And if we find that, we will just ignore it unless it is obviously points related to the new data that was added. And obviously, if it's points that a referee overlooked simply, then it's a huge caveat in the paper and the referee goes, oops, I totally forgot that. I really apologize And in the first round. We will obviously not overlook that because it's a flaw in the paper that it's not in your interest as an author to publish this paper then. We're also thinking about structured referee report to channel the information that we get a bit more, but this is quite controversial and we haven't started this yet. Okay. Um, so why are we doing these peer process files? In our, in our view, it really showcases the quality and efficiency of the process. We haven't really seen a huge improvement in the quality of the reports we get, but I think it showcases um, that the reports that we get for our papers is, is on average actually really good. It's uh, therefore nice teaching tools. If, um, if you haven't refereed much, just click into some papers in your field in the Embo journal and you'll see the sort of uh, typical referee comments that, that we get to, to, to train yourself basically. Um, it also gives referee credit in principle for an essential con contribution to, uh, to the whole scientific process. Now these referee reports are obviously not named, but we're thinking about um, adding the names after a certain period of time. We've been discouraged from doing that, but in principle that's possible. We could also add a digital signature to those reports and um, the, code, the code to which fun funding agencies have. But the funding agencies we've talked to have had no, no interest in that. But I think it would really give referees credit that could be taken into account at least at the tenure track level um, by, by institutions. So I'd be very interested to, to hear feedback on, on, on that technology that we could develop in principle. Um, just to point out that other journals are also doing this um, and more and more journals are doing this. Um, so I think it's important to emphasize that this, uh, this is not just us. Okay? Um, furthermore, at the end of the day, you really have uh, three the summaries on a paper by three independent experts. Um, you know that many journals pu publish small news and views on a selection of papers. For us, you could say we have three news and views against every paper that we publish, which is really great. That's what these uh, statistics look like. You can see exactly the, the percentages that were sent out to the board, et cetera, et cetera, which I talked you through. The timings, uh, the, the timelines, um, how long we, we take to do things, and the actual times for every man manuscript when it was submitted, when, it, when the first editorial decision was sent out, et cetera. And then you have this, what we call a transaction report. Now, importantly, the authors can always opt out of this process at any stage, but only um, less than 5% to about 4.8% of authors decide that they don't want to uh, publish the referee reports. So I think that's a really great endorsement that, that authors actually value the process. Um, also, our, referee, uh, our referees have not declined more. In fact, we have a higher rate of, of, of acceptance of referees now at 44%, which is, which is actually really nice and encouraging. And, and we don't edit any of the reports unless there's really gratuitous and horrendous typos. So that's what these things actually look, look like in real time, uh, in, in real life. And I just want to make the point that some, sometimes authors add data that's just to address a referee point that, that they don't want to go into the paper. If you have done that and you don't want to have this in the transaction file, it's absolutely fine to tell us that's the only thing that we will edit out. If, if you tell us you want to reserve this data for, for, for another paper, just tell us and we'll just put a little note here saying data was removed. And are these things actually read? Well, we, uh, we did a bit of statistics on this and, and they read about one-tenth of the, the total paper down downloads, which is very surprisingly high, I thought. Uh, and the papers that receive the biggest downloads, there's a pretty straight correlation with the total access to the manuscript. It's not the most controversial papers, it's just the best read papers. And the, some of the papers we are most proud to publish, actually. So I've, I've written a bit more about this in various places. Um, there's a Nature paper recently about uh, um, sum, summarizing what we're doing. And just yesterday, Nature came out with, with this comment of, of a guy who clearly hasn't read this, this thing just a couple of weeks earlier that asked for this, why don't you make the peer review uh, process public, which is what we've done. And then this re I just wanted to emphasize this cross-refereeing between re uh, referees. We give re referees a day to come back to us and comment on the reports of the other referees before we formulate a decision. That's turned out to be really successful. We have about a 30% response rate, and most of those responses are really, really uh, very, very helpful to the editors. They can be both positive or negative. So um, the most helpful ones are often uh, where referee C 3 says point 0.3 of referee 1 is really over the top, and you should think twice about it. Um, here's one example of where it really helped. So this one referee, as I just said, came, came back and said of about two other referees that in one case, we, we were on the verge of rejecting this paper actually because referee two said there's simply no novelty. There's three or four other papers which have already made exactly the key points. And he says, this is definitely not the case. I'm, I'm actually on one of those papers. 
and, and the, while they've claimed those points, they haven't shown these points. So that's an important thing which can easily elude the, uh, elude the editor. So that was very helpful to us. And then there was an, an, an experimental issue that the author wanted a much more, uh, the referee three wanted a much more advanced differentiation system for the, uh, for the deep side um, differentiation. We had a talk about this today, so I'm sure you're interested in this. And uh, this referee one, who is a world expert in this field, actually came, came back and said, said well, this, this is state of the art, basically. So we incorporated this straight into our decision letter. We said, you do not have to address these two issues raised by referee two. You do not have to do it, referee three. You do not have to do this. And it completely changed our decision letter, I think. So, and now a few points about paper of the future. Um, Point one, we really don't want to turn into Google, where you just type in your, your protein of interest, RAS, or what have you, and you, you pick out the latest papers every week. We want, uh, it's, it's crucial, I think, in the scientific process, scientific education, that you read across the subject. So we want to retain browsing, basically, and, uh, and that's a really big challenge as this literature is growing um, in log phase at the moment. Um, one thing that's obviously going to happen and is already happening across several journals is online platforms, which will, which will change the way people read papers dramatically. Um, and then uh, by December, you will see this kind of look and feel of the EMBO journal, um, which will be a much more dynamic um, reading environment. I mean, uh, more than 95% of our readers are online now, and we still um, publish papers really that are optimized for print production. So we will change that. Things are much more free flow. You can see all the figures in a scroll bar. You can open all the sections from a tab bar. And there's, there's a lot of linking out. There's collapsible sections. The citations to the article are listed on the right. You can have chemical structures linked straight back from, from the article. And this links into the ChemSpider database and so on. So, but this is all cosmetics. This is really nice and important, but it's all cosmetics. So what we really want to develop is to have two versions of a paper. One is um, the current view that we have with standard resolution, quickly downloadable figures, with, with some supplementary information at the end of the paper. Um, we will add visual abstracts. I will show you what this looks like in, in a minute. And we want to have summaries. And, and in this paper sort of um, boxes, I will show you what this is in a minute. Um, this is really for the general reader to make sure that people that are not expert in the field are interested in reading a paper. And we want to have an expert view, which has much higher resolution figures, which take much longer to download if you use microscopy, and which have integrated supplementary figures. And a few, uh, a few examples of what this looks like from Embo and like, um, uh, Medicine. This is a box in every paper that has the paper explained that makes it, um, makes it accessible for, for the general reader. And we have these visual abstracts, which we are just trialing now, which um, basically are supposed to complement the abstract. It's a bit of uh, what Cell is doing too, but the difference for us is that our art editors paint them, uh, uh, draw them, and they're actually much more, much, much nicer that way. So, so in, in, in this example, this, this also allows you to, to navigate the information in the paper very quickly. You can see it's a human paper um, that, has, that has cell biology in it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the drawing that we got, that we based this on, and it took about one, one hour for the, for the artist to, to generate. So um, I just want to use this slide to emphasize, feel absolutely free to submit hand-drawn um, flow, flow diagrams and figures to us. We're more than happy to, to redraw them for you. This is this point about supplementary information. We want to start embedding, and th this is actually what Cell does now too. We want to start embedding the supplementary figures into the main paper. So you have one paper flow for the expert version, and the supplementary figures should always link back to actually a, a real figure in the paper. But the next step really is, is much, much more advanced. Um, what we really need is to interlink data text, methods, and the literature much, much better. That's the only way you can um, intelligently navigate all this information. And that's uh, an easy slide, but it's extremely hard to do. Um, one thing that will facilitate that, that we are uh, a, a founding member of, is the ORCID initiative, which gives every one of you a digital identifier, which basically uh, resolves the problem of name, of, of name ambiguity. It's in particularly important, obviously, for Asian names. But this will be a tag that you carry for the rest of your scientific career and that you can use to sign off all sorts of things, including figure panels. So we call this micro-attribution, which is an important development from my point of view, so that every author can sign off on subparts of a figure that they've done, which is, which is a much more transparent way to apportion credit and also to apportion blame if something goes wrong with the figures. Um, and the next step really is to focus on data for us. So, so the key issues for us are source data, and I will show you what, what I mean by this in a minute. And then we want to make the, the data itself discoverable. At the moment, you use text searching to, um, 
to, to, to find information, we, we, we want to add to that um, the data searching. Okay? Um, data deposition in databases, there's lots of types of data which have no databases yet. That's a huge problem we have to resolve. Then this micro-attribution point that I just made, and then we want to open the data to actually allow the data search fun functionality. Okay. Um, so this is what source data looks like at uh, molecular system storage. We've done this for a couple of years now, where basically whenever there's uh, graphs in a paper, authors are invited to add the, the, the Excel files that underlie that. You get the raw data, and you can basically replot the data, which allows you to redo the statistics to really see what was done and to actually integrate that information into your systems biology project. So that's very important for, for systems biologists, but it's also important for anyone uh, reading manuscripts. What we want to have is people publishing real data. Another uh, way to, to achieve the same goal for other types of data is um, a, a lot of molecular biologists use Western blotting or, or generally blotting gels. We want to have a supplementary figure that summarizes all the gels in uncropped form, basically. That's what we call source data. For statistics, it's, it's again the same thing. What we want to have, um, especially if your n values are small, which they are in most types of uh, molecular biology, we want you to plot the actual data points, not just the, uh, the averages. And we also want to be much more stringent on, on how you uh, define your statistics and, what's, and when to do statistics and when not to do statistics. That's, that's a real problem in, in cell biology. This is how, how we envisage the search. The, the, the big issue is it's very hard to search for complex experiments. For example, what factors cause a change in ERK activation? Or what's the time scale for cusp 3 dependent apoptosis? And if you've just got a result back and you found a, a, a really quick response and you want to see who else found this atypically quick response, maybe nobody, in which case you have a really novel, novel observation. Maybe it's, maybe it's standard. Okay, so, so that, those sort of searches, if you try them on PubMed, you, you won't get any hits back at all. So we need new search strategies. What we really want is if you have an experimental result like this, we want to find similar experiments. I don't have time to run through, through this, but these are all related experiments published in totally different form, as you can see. And this is an absolutely non-trivial thing to do. Um, the step one is really from the source data. Here's one example from this, um, this molecular systems biology paper that I just mentioned, um, which was discovered through Google search, actually, by, by putting in this complex query, which wouldn't have hit anything on PubMed, but through Google, which, which has indexed the metadata, which was the source data associated with the graphs, it actually finds the paper. It, it wouldn't have found this query through the normal text search. And this is a project outline. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to not go into that in any de detail. But we have a project running now um, with various partners that, that, will, that will achieve that. Um, ultimately, we may launch a, actually a whole platform that allows you to share various um, types of data in, uh, in various le uh, levels of, of, of privacy in the future. And then just to finish up, do you have a couple of minutes? Yes, five. Yeah. Five. Oh, great. Um, just a few points about, about ethics, because we do actually find um, an increasing number of problems. So just on, so I came here, what, what day is it today? Just on Wednesday, uh, we found two papers by a famous Japanese author that we published five years ago, have manipulated images in it, and uh, very seriously manipulated images, which was point, pointed out by, by another PI at, at the NBL, actually. Uh, at this, on the same day, we found that, that a review was 71% plagiarized, uh, self-plagiarized, actually, uh, remarkably. So we see a lot of problems nowadays. And this is clearly because, A, we're, we're looking much more for, uh, for, for what's going on, and B, because the pressures to publish are so much higher, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to be tempted, basically. But obviously, we realize that we only see the tip of the iceberg, because if you really want to cheat, you can obviously cheat at the level, uh, at, an, at an upstream level, which no referee and no, uh, no editor will ever see. If you can change your experimental design, you can just forget to report negative uh, data, you, or you can do so selective data reporting. You can obviously just pipette in double the amount into a gel lane, and your band will be double. Um, what we see is obviously only the, f the final thing, which is the photoshopping. Um, and a few experts have told us this, this guy we've, we've, we've had as a consultant from the FBI said basically seeing is no longer believing actually what you see is largely irrelevant, which really brings it to a, to a point. Um, the important point to make though is that most of what we see is what we would call beautification. So it's people trying to make their data more black and white um, just to make it more beautiful really, um, to make it more clear because they feel the referees and editors want striking effects. We don't. We want well-controlled experiments that are significant. It's a very different thing. Um, the, my, my, the 
vast minority that must be better word for this is is for fabrication and fraud of the type of to the Tokyo type I've just told you about. So this this is an example of beautification. I've, I've lots and lots of examples if you're interested, but I won't go through them now. That's what we see all the time that people put a black box around their their Western blot and it's spliced together from four different experiments. What's worrying here is that these bands are actually on one gel and these are on four, four different, sorry, there's two splices here, there's two splices here, and there's just one splice here. So this is kind of cobbled together from various bits of gels. And um, in a case like this, we were asked the author to submit us, to us the source data, the raw data, and we will see if they were run on, on, on the same gel. If they weren't run on the same gel, they have to prove to us that they were run on adjacent gels on the same day. If they run on different weeks, and there's many authors out there, they are very surprised that we're worried about this. You cannot put this together in one experiment, of course. Now, this, this is an example of fraud. And when I was at Nature Cell Biology, this, this was the first really dramatic case uh, where a person reinserted um, reused bands between totally different experiments. You can see this little telltale sign here, this little, little smudge, which was, which was reused as a band upside down which was a bit silly because they were adjacent panels, totally different experiments, but this happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, you, you can see various other, um, other marks, like here there's a clear cut sign. And here's a very recent example from a very senior person. In fact, they're so senior they're already retired now, um, where they basically just cobbled together cells to make a nice, beautiful view. And, and, and this is fine, of course, this is just beautification, but you simply can't presented in this way without any lines and so on. Um, you have to say this is an assemblage, this is a mosaic of cells that was made for space reasons with lots and lots of white lines. Really suboptimal. Sub What's frustrating about this case is that the author would not understand that he can't do this. He, I mean, to this day, he refuses to acknowledge that that was, that was a problematic thing to do. Um, but you can, you can basically beautify in other ways. You can rev up the contrast until you lose important information to make the data more clear cut. We see this all the time, of course. Um, please don't do it. Try to show this sort of data. And another th thing we see increasingly is this is not systems biology. This is meant to be real data. There are people just smoothen out their graphs. This, is, this was after we cured this because it looked a little bit too perfect. We, we got this data. That's the real data. Don't, don't just draw idealized graphs through, uh, through some data points, please. And then obviously, I'm, I'm finishing, this is the last slide, um, play, plagiarism is basically um, um, fairly frequent, but not as frequent as people think in primary science at least. It happens more in reviews. It, it really um, goes beyond cutting and pasting text, though. It involves concepts and results. It can involve um, patterns. It can involve grant applications, importantly. Um, so, so it goes well beyond the, the, the published paper. And of course, there's a few very beautiful um, high-profile examples from ministers in Iran and Germany that who, have, who have engaged in various activities like that. Well, what we see most frequently is self-plagiarism, which people don't seem to understand. You can't just keep republishing the same information without telling people, uh, without a proper citation back to the original paper. That's um, actually plagiarism. And we use an automatic system to screen for this, and this is how we found the 71% um, duplication, okay? And what we do now is we have a person who, who routinely checks all accepted papers with various color, um, blah, 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 um, things to, uh, to, to, to screen for manipulation. And this, this gel looks com completely fine to the naked eye in black and white, but you can immediately see if you do a false color that uh, various of the bands are complete duplications. I'm sure you can see them, this one and this one, et cetera. So, so we find a few things, but this is tot completely the tip of the iceberg. Um, so what we really rely on is post-publication feedback. We've thought about automating this, but it's really not possible. And we also don't want to start a cat and mouse game. We're not the data police. We, we rely on post-publication feedback of authors that can't reproduce data and go more in, into papers and find that they're actually uh, manipulated. So do tell us, please. But publication of the source data um, and associated metadata will, of, of course, help that because it's simply more more hard or harder to, to cheat that way. Um, this is about whistleblowing. I just want to make one quick point is don't send generic messages like this, which, which I received when I was at, at Nature Cell Biology. This paper in science is fraudulent and this, this, this lab is really bad. <laughs> um, we were just exposed, this is a paper we just had to retract at the Embo Journal, uh, literally a, few, a couple of months ago. You may have heard of the Bullfornic Pouse case, which is very pro prominent now. This was basically, she was um, basically publicly hanged and flogged with, uh, before we could do an investigation through a secret whistleblower who remained anonymous to this day, although we know now who it is. 
who, who was a disgruntled ex-postdoc in the lab um, and basically put, put um, whistleblowing information on, on an untraceable Panamanian website and went to various newspapers. The Spiegel picked it up and basically publicly ex exposed her without any, any valid um, investigative work having been done. Um, Nature reported on this, how, how bad this sort of uh, whistleblowing is. You should always go first to the people involved, to, to the PI. You should then go to the ombudsman in your institution, go to the journal that has published the work, and, and do a proper, a proper um, investigation. I mean, pe people are, should not be guilty before they have been tried, as is the case in all, in all ro robust countries, I would say. Thank you.